Hey guys, this is John with Forward Talk. Uh, here again, we have a special guest with us today, doctoral candidate Clayton Killian. And uh, Clayton, we are so happy to have you on Forward Talk with us. It's great to be here, John. Um, doctoral student, I'm not to candidacy okay. yet. Okay, all right, I got you, doctoral student. So uh, it will be, candidacy will be coming, what, in uh, a year or two? Yeah, I've got another year of PhD coursework, and then after that, I'll be... The dissertation starts? Yeah, yeah, and then I'll, if I can pass off my prospectus, then I'll be a candidate, and then I just have to write the thing. I got you. And uh, so, so let's just go back uh, uh, a little ways before we start working into all of that, and we are, I want to talk to you today about your educational journey and um, kind of how you how you feel that um, education the role how you feel about the role that education should play in the lives of apostolics and mm -hmm. so that's that's going to be a huge emphasis in what we talk about today. By All the right. way, um, Clayton and I are, are flying by the seat of our pants today. He has no clue what I'm I'm going to be asking him. I probably don't even know what all I'm going to be asking him. So. Uh, kind of like the last interview that I did with Jason Weatherly, this is just uh, a couple of friends having a conversation and you guys get to watch it. So, so here we are. But anyway, the first memories that I, the first memories that I have of you uh, were just a, a teenage kid sitting on the front row at the church in Murfreesboro, Pastor Worthens, and just devouring preaching. Um, I don't, do you have any clue how long ago that was that we first met? Man, that's, it's been over a decade ago. When yeah. we, it's probably been 12 or, you know, 10 or 12 years ago. Since so you we were what, met. 12 years old? I, I was 13, 14 at the very oldest whenever we first met, but probably yeah. 12. So, yeah, I just, um, I always, when I'm preaching, I always, lock on to somebody in the congregation that's like that's feeding off of what I'm saying and I ignore everybody else in the building and I focus on that one that one person and uh, very often you were that person preaching at at Life Tabernacle and so um, your hunger for God his word and just your your passion for spiritual things has been impressive since I first remember you. Oh man, I appreciate that. You uh, you were always one of the people that I enjoyed that would come through because I I love all preaching, but just by my bent, I'm a teacher yeah. myself. And so when someone moves systematically through the word and they're teaching and they're connecting concepts, that's what I eat up. Yeah. Well, that's definitely my style of of uh, teaching and preaching. And so even when I'm preaching, I'm still, I'm still preaching in a very structured, systematic uh, way. I don't, I don't ever just do what we, what we call shotgun preaching, just all over the place. I'm, I'm I have a very systematic approach, whether I'm uh, teaching or preaching. So. I can remember one sermon when you came to new life, when you, said outright that you were just shooting from the hip and you had no clue yeah exactly where it was going to go one time and all the times that I've heard you and you you did great but I mean it was obvious that you were you were enjoying yourself but you were not comfortable with this <laughs> mode of preaching at all yeah it's that's extremely extremely rare that I would ever do that but uh so so uh just Tell everybody your journey toward uh, the academic world and where it started, what motivated it, and kind of why you want to pursue academia. So my academic journey started in the pew. It, it started at the altar. Um, 
the only reason I'm really interested in serious academic scholarship is because I wanted to know more about the Bible. Yeah. I, I always enjoyed reading and stuff like that, but you can read at home. You don't have yeah. to go into the academy to do that. So talk to us uh, about your degrees up to this point, your degree track, your educational track up to this point. So while I was still in high school, I started taking college classes at our local um, community college. And the goal was to, to get a very practical degree, something that I can like go out and, and, and get earn a job. A, yeah, get a job with, earn a good living with. Um, I, I was raised on a, a small farm in Southern Illinois, we had goats and chickens and my dad owned his own business. So um, I, I tend to have a, a practical stance or, or at least uh, voices of practical wisdom behind me. Yeah. So my first degree was actually an associate's degree in mechanical drafting. Okay. Um, like engineering sort of stuff that I could go to, to any factory and and get a reasonably good paying job with. Yeah. Um, when I graduated, I was top of my class. I you know I had highest honors. I was one of two people who graduated that semester that didn't get a job. Oh wow. I I looked for a job. I had interviews. N nobody was interested. That's when and, God chuckles at our best laid plans. Oh yeah, the the best laid plans of mice and men, and yeah. and so I thought, well, you know, this stinks. Um, so I just took whatever job I could find, um, you know, just because I didn't think I should sit at home. I should work, and after about a year of working, you know, at at Walmart mostly, I thought, I'm I'm going to try to go back to school and see if and see if anything comes of this. Uh, drafting didn't work. The, the practical didn't work. So this time I'm going to go back and I'm going to get a degree in ancient languages. Yeah. Just, There's something that I'm passionate about rather than trying to, uh, to do something that makes sense yeah. solely, that just yeah. solely makes sense, that, that my heart and soul is not in, but... Uh, this time I'm going to do something that I care about that's meaningful to me that that I'm passionate about. Right. And the way I was thinking about it is, even if this never earns me a dime, I, I want to know more about the Bible. And this is an opportunity to study Greek at a more advanced level. And and it's you an, taught it's, yourself some Greek before you started this program, right? Yes. And I, I should say, like, starting in middle school, starting at sixth grade all the way through high school, I was learning Latin. Yeah. And so by the time I went to Southern Illinois University, I had already read Cicero. Um, I, I had already read Caesar and, and some of these more well-known authors. So I was good at it anyway. Yeah. And, and I thought, well, this is, this is what I'm going to do. And at, at first, I started taking some, some online classes just from a, a small little Bible college that's based in Florida. And the, the plan was, well, I'm going to go to this small little Bible college just because I want to know more about the Bible. But they don't offer Greek, so I'm going to take Greek at my local university to sort of fill in the gaps. Yeah. And so we go... My, my mother and I go to the orientation and we're, we're sitting in like the, the orientation campus visit and they had given everybody like a folder and a, you know, this packet to look over. And so I open it up while the, the dude is yammering on up front. And I'm kind of, <laughs> professional academics have a way of speaking and that's why I'm, I'm glad I'm apostolic because yeah. we sort of, Alan's that, but anyway, so I'm thumbing through it and a paper falls out and, and 
it, it's like out of a movie, man, just like floats <laughs> down to the floor. And, and of course, I'm trying not to make a scene. And my mother leans over and says, Clayton, what, what's that paper that fell out? And, you know, I'm, I'm you know, really trying to keep a, a low profile. Nothing, mom. And I'm like cramming it back into the folder. And she said, no, let, let me see that. Let me look at that. So I hand it to her and her eyes get wide. And she says, I have to go to the financial aid office right now. I'll meet you back here. So she goes and she talks to the financial aid department. And I got my first year at SIU for less than one course would cost if I were paying out of pocket. That's incredible. That's how many scholarships and opportunities that, that the Lord opened. And I was able to work at Walmart and completely fund my, my bachelor's degree just with small, occasional part-time work. And what was the bachelor's degree in now? I know, but the audience doesn't know. Yeah. Um, so the technical name is <coughs> languages, cultures, and international trade with an emphasis in classics. But okay. it's basically like an ancient history and ancient languages degree. So, of course, the, the language was Greek. Uh, Greek and Latin. Other, okay, that's what I was about to ask. Were there any other languages involved in that? Uh, yeah. That class. And so, so there were some cool things that you got to do in that, in that degree with languages that, um, that you should tell us about. Oh, yeah, yeah, the manuscript project. So I actually wrote a couple of articles. Um, oh, yeah, shout out your blog right now. This is an awesome opportunity to shout out your blog. So um, I, I write, yeah, lectionary. Um, I guess we can link it in the description. We can. Right. Uh, thanks, man. So lectionary, I write about all things Bible. Some of it's apologetics. Some of it's church history. Some of it's just working through a passage, bringing out the, the awesome things that God has hidden his word. Yeah. So, so, on, so the, the manuscript project. On, on my site, I wrote a couple of articles about this. While I was at SIU, I got the chance to work with and transcribe a 14th century Latin manuscript um, known as the Meditationes Vitae Christi. And the backstory on this manuscript at SIU is pretty cool. Um, there's less than a hundred of these manuscripts in, in the world, maybe, maybe slightly over a hundred, but there's about a hundred of them. Um, and the oldest copies in known existence are like at the Bodleian Library in England, at the Vatican, um, at, at some pretty well-known places. Well, the SIU, the Southern Illinois University copy of the Meditationes Vitae Christi was found by one of the uh, special collections curators in the bottom of a mislabeled box. Oh, and wow. I, I think the lady's name was Melissa Hubbard. We've had some interactions in the past, um, but found it in the bottom of a mislabeled box. Didn't know how the university got it. Didn't know where they bought it from. <laughs> it, it was just one of those things that, it turned up that, that SIU had it. So at the time, a, a classics professor named Daniel Moore, who, who now teaches at Indiana State, if I have my facts straight, um, started looking at this manuscript and comparing it with the critical edition of the manuscript. And it turns out that the SIU copy is probably one of the earliest copies of this thing in known existence. Wow. And it has an extra chapter. There were so many chapters like in, in this book. It has an epilogue at the back that is unique to the SIU copy. Oh, it's wow. It's not in any other manuscript. That's incredible. And, and so, so you got to work through that. You got to, uh, did you do some translation work with it? I did a little bit of translation. Most of what I was doing 
was transcribing. So I was taking those old Gothic uh, script letters and converting them into print that most humans can read. Yeah, I got you. Well, that's pretty exciting. So you have a bachelor's in uh, the classics, which includes Latin and Greek. <clears throat> now, the master's, uh, starting your graduate work, where where did you do that and in what um, discipline? So I stayed around at SIU because in my time getting a classics degree, I had made friends with a couple of the English professors. Um, my first class at SIU was actually uh, the Bible as literature. Okay. And, and so I, I made friends with a professor in that class and a couple <laughs> others. And so the, the plan was to continue getting a classics degree somewhere else. And I just needed some time to fill the gap. But once I got into the English program, I thought, you know, this is, this is working out well. And it's not entirely useless, right? Even, even though it's in a different language, you're still learning how well, to read literature. You know, whatever projects, whatever books you write in the future, uh, is not, you're not going to be writing it in all Latin or all Greek. <laughs> right. So, so that, that English degree is going to be very helpful in your, in, in your writing future so the the only problem is is that like man i can't make a spelling mistake or a grammar mistake if there's any grammatical iniquity in my writing that's you know the degree is at the back so i've got to <laughs> myself on that um but yeah i i got into the english program at siu and was able to so support myself because I was also teaching English for the college. Okay. So not only did I get a tuition waiver because that's what they do for grad assistants. Um, so I had to pay fees, but no tuition costs and they're paying me to teach English at the college. So it took care of itself pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was still working a little bit um, part-time at Walmart, but between that and the money that I was making at the college, uh, that allowed me to support myself, save some money, and, and eventually have the means to, to get married in between my first and second year of my master's degree. All right, so you have an associate's, associate's degree in some kind of drafting yeah, in CAD technology or something. Okay, so you have a, an associate's in drafting. You have uh, a bachelor's in the classics. You have a master's in English. And that all plays into your work that you are currently doing at St. Louis University. Yeah. At the doctoral um, level. Yes. So I I got into the... PhD program at SLU for historical theology uh, about a year ago. And historical theology is essentially um, the history of Christianity. If it's the patristic era. So okay. anything. Define post- for our audience what the, you were probably doing that, but define for our audience what the patristic era, era is. Um, so the patristic era, um, time is essentially anything after the New Testament was finished up through the early Middle Ages, which ends around the 7th century. Okay. So it includes the church fathers? um... Yeah. Uh, Everybody from like Clement and Irenaeus, who were in the late 1st to early 2nd century. Yes. Up through... The seventh? Yeah. Basil, Gregory, Maximus the Confessor. Uh, It's pretty much anything after the New Testament before the Quran. Oh, okay. 
see that was a little tad bit tidbit that that i didn't really yeah um most people cool. don't realize it but as, as best i understand if i'm misspeaking the audience is welcome to correct me yeah but islam is actually not an ancient religion it's an early medieval religion yeah exactly man that's that's absolutely um absolutely incredible and of course i have a tremendous amount of respect for uh what you have done what you are doing and of course um i respect uh your intelligence your love for god which to me is just as important as a person's intelligence and education <clears throat> is their heart and love for god and so uh because of that that spiritual component of what who you are as a person i ask you to uh to to read and uh write a kind of a review for my book on divorce and re remarriage which fortunately uh, you ended up disagreeing with portions of it, final conclusion, which is going to be uh, a lot of fun uh, oh, no. going, forward, going forward in the future. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you're, you're actually at some point possibly going to write a, uh, write a critique of it, uh, a review or something of that nature, which, which will be awesome. And uh, I think that apostolics, uh, seriously need to start engaging in with each other in this kind of way. And as friends and brothers in Christ, I think, I think it will be awesome if you do. And if you happen to point out uh, some places where uh, I missed it and where I need to go back and rethink and correct uh, my, my view on this topic, then I will be the better for it. Everybody will be the better for it. So I'm, I'm, I will, I'm not afraid of it and uh, will certainly not be offended by it. So, well, I, I appreciate that. I can say this, my goal isn't to crucify you. Oh, and, of course not. <laughs> and, and it's, it's not with any other apostolic brother, really m most other Christians that I engage. My purpose is, is not to attack iron sharpens iron. And of course, sometimes with that comes friction but it can be profitably directed. Oh, absolutely. But I at least did a, I think you think I at least did a good job of presenting my view though, right? Oh, you, you did a great job of presenting your view and I'm not in total disagreement with, with every point. I, I'm not in total disagreement with every point. Yeah, I'm in disagreement with one or two, but yeah, not, not all of it. And so I think that will be awesome for uh, there to be a, a good response and critique so far i've gotten nothing from anybody um all i've all i've gotten is is the drive-by attacks and uh kind of behind the scenes table talk at conferences where people are more than cri criticizing me more than the content which is never helpful and so um, i'm looking forward to someone doing a uh, uh an an intelligent academic response to to that work and so i hope you do and i hope others do not not just you mm -hmm. attacking the person can be a useful rhetorical strategy if you're just trying to score points yes and I, i'm not going to pretend that it isn't effective it like, is it, it it can be very effective especially for certain audiences but yeah. attacking the man is a sure sign of a weak argument. And it does absolutely nothing to, to undermine the truthfulness of a claim to attack the person who makes the claim. Right. So if a person's goal is truth, if a person's goal is an accurate, an accurate um, understanding of a topic, then they're only going to go after content and argumentation, never the individual. Mm-hmm. So, um, what do you think? What do you think uh, is the value of apostolics being involved in academia? And I'm going to follow this up before I let you answer. Um, I am still early in my academic work, but 
I will eventually uh, complete a PhD uh, in some theological discipline. Uh, I'm going to be early 50s when I finish it, <coughs> but um, that's, I guess, completely irrelevant for me personally. It's the journey that's awesome, and of course, I've for the last 10 years at least, I've I've read, I've engaged in reading the highest levels of theological books. And so uh, basically my purpose in getting education is to, to formalize it in a way that allows me to, to teach um, uh, in college um, and to, to have opportunities to, to be published and things of that nature that I wouldn't without formalizing my, my degree. Mm -hmm. But I, I honestly, there's times when I get extremely frustrated that uh, the, the mentality in Pentecost when I grew up was extremely anti-education. In fact, there were times where it was preached against, that mm -hmm. we were uh, basically told that there is no way to, to, to survive um, college without losing your apostolic identity, without losing your, your faith. And um, the, the fir kind of the first people that I remember uh, going to Bible college, even apostolic Bible colleges, even um, like JCM and Jackson back in the day. In uh, the group of, of uh, Pentecost that I grew up in, you know, that's going to ruin that boy. He's going to come out as a come out of college with no conviction. He, he's not going to raving he's not gonna charismatic. Believe, yeah, he's going to be charismatic. He's not going to believe anything. Uh, Bible college is going to, is going to run him, um, that kind of thing. And so, uh, education was not only discouraged, it was, it was deemed as carnal and, and fleshly and anti-spiritual. And so <clears throat> we were, it was not only discouraged, it was often preached against to get, uh, any kind of, um, collegiate education, whether, uh, you know, interestingly, especially in theology, especially mm -hmm. in a biblical education. Uh, if we let you do anything, it was, it was, you could go to a community college and get a, a practical degree, you know, mm -hmm. go Trade somewhere locally. Exactly. Um, and so how important do you think it is that apostolics get formal theological uh, theological training? And uh, do you see any pitfalls uh, involved in doing it? And do they outweigh the benefits of, of formal theological training? So I'll, I'll talk about the macro level and then like more, more personal level. On a macro level, Pentecost needs scholars. Yes. We have to have them. And if for no other reason than uh, to, to use scriptural language, uh, to still the enemy and the avenger, yeah. <laughs> like to just quiet people down. I don't know how many times as, as an independent researcher and kind of like a, an online apologist, I don't know how many times I've had people throw at me, well, you Pentecostals don't have any Bible scholars. You don't have any recognized, published, PhD-holding scholars. Yeah. And, and the ones of you that do, every once in a while, one of you will get a degree, but you're just a, a PhD-holding snake handler. You're just putting a, <laughs> It's ridiculous. Like, yeah. you're, you're just putting a scholarly veneer on your ridiculous ideas, as, yeah. as if that's as if that's what we're doing. Yeah. And, and so if for no other reason than that, we have to, to show that we're, we're not insane. Yeah. I mean, just, just to be crass for so long and, and it's starting to turn the, the tide is starting to turn, it is. but for so long, it was assumed that the Pentecostal church was the church on the other side of the track. That's yeah. the people, that's the, those are the people that are going to dance and they might carry snakes and who knows what's going to go on. Yeah. And, and so 
if for no other reason than to counter those illegitimate stereotypes. And, and saying what you just said in a different way, it will give us a seat at the table to have mm -hmm. big discussions. And eventually they will not be able, and they're already not able to do it uh, fully, but eventually they will not be able to ignore us. Right. Right. They will have to include us in the conversation. They will not be able to ignore us. And I can't see a scenario where that is a bad thing. No. <laughs> like in, in what way is that negative? Another thing that this does is it opens up witnessing potential. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I have, I've led people to the Lord while getting my master's degree at Southern Illinois University, and I hope I get the same chance while I'm at St. Louis University. Absolutely. And those are people, A, I would have never met them. Yeah. And B, I wouldn't have the credibility to speak to them in an without, academic Without the academic uh, connection with them. Right. Even though we were peers, we were, I was a master's student and my friend was a, a doctoral student, even though we were peers, roughly speaking, people who are in these contexts, who are in the academy, who are in professional education, they're just as hungry as anybody else. They oh, want to be led, but they've got different questions. Yeah. They've got different issues. Yeah. The, the, the questions that I had to answer for my friends at Southern Illinois University were not the questions that I have to answer for a working man from rural Missouri. Exactly. Exactly. And, and so if, if we demonize education, if we, if we make it look less than spiritual, that's a whole demographic of people that we're not offering salvation. And to act like that, using the mind and engaging the intellect is somehow not spiritual, just completely misses uh, a, a sincere, rich, not only theology, but anthropology. And the, the idea that, that, that Lagos is an essential component to divine being, John 1, if you accept it as you do, 1 John 5, 7. <laughs> um, maybe we'll talk about that in just a little bit, but I, I might surprise you with my answer. Maybe, but first John are uh, the idea that logos is essential to divine being, which is, is, is logic. It's, it's in engaging mental uh, acumen. And so there is nothing more spiritual than a God who was logical who created logical image bearing creatures and for that image bearing creature to worship that logical God with his mind. As Jesus says, when he quotes the first, the, the first commandment in the gospels, mm -hmm. you shall love the Lord, your God with all of your normal Art. stuff but, and your mind. And so the idea that somehow using your brain to engage God is that it's not spiritual is just misses a huge rich aspect of understanding both God and man. Yeah. We, you already referred to John chapter one, like the logos is God. Yeah. Rationality is part of God's essential nature and even evolutionists refer to us as homo sapiens. We are the, the thinking man. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's like our scientific name, even for, even for people who don't believe in a God at all. And the, the risk of, of de-emphasizing education is, is we put all of our emphasis on the material. Yeah. And, and this is a, a weird thing that previous generations have done is we, we preach about all of these spiritual things, you know, the, the fruit of the spirit being filled with the spirit led by the spirit. But then when it comes to doing something immaterial and spiritual, yeah. 
by using our minds, yes. well, all of a sudden that's not practical. And where's the, where's the solid fruit of it? We, that you can build the church without ever picking up a hammer. Yeah. And, and I'm not, I'm not devaluing the physical work. We need missionaries to go. Absolutely. We need buildings to be built, but we also need people to, to think and to engage scholarly. And if, if I can just like bear my soul for just a second, devaluing education doesn't just hurt people on the outside that need salvation. Yeah. What does that do to the young person sitting on the pew? Yeah. You, you probably know where I'm going with this. Yeah, go ahead, but fin finish that it. Young, that young man on the pew who enjoys sports but is not the best sports player, loves working with their hands, but they're not a carpenter. And the thing they're best at is the Bible. Yeah. They, <laughs> and God forbid that we should uh, encourage him to maximize his, his, his God-given skill set and understanding right. scripture. And, and like, I'm, I'm not trying to be a bleeding heart, but at different times, whenever the only thing you're good at gets devalued, yeah, it, it can be alienating. Yes, like, it can. I'm trying. And then we wonder why we, we lose such a large demographic of the next generation when we devalue the only thing that that they are that they are gifted at. Man, such an incredible, incredible point. And the the only thing, like like, and this is something I'll get to in a second. I don't think college is for everybody. Whenever I was teaching English at Southern Illinois University. It, college isn't for everybody, but w for the people that are good at it, why would we discourage it? We yeah. need apostolic lawyers. Yes. We Absolutely. need apostolic doctors. Absolutely. Heaven forbid we have apostolic theologians. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so it's, it's about, it's about dominion and, and taking territory. That is territory that yes. we are reclaiming from the devil. It's, the earth is the Lord's, Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Every mm -hmm. aspect of the cosmos is God's. It belongs to him. And everything that is, that is sinful or, and wrong about our world is simply a distortion of something good. And so the idea that, that a Christian would not, would not reclaim what what sin and Satan has distorted for the glory of God is is just beyond me. Two two things, and then and then I'll <laughs> let you move on. On that distortion point, most of the major universities today began as seminaries. Harvard, University of Chicago, I think Yale still has a divinity school. Absolutely. So. And, and some of these schools are the, like the biggest sources for pumping out hurtful agendas today. Yeah. And so the devil does definitely distort. But secondly, it's been a part of the Christian tradition for millennia to, to build a church on the site of either a pagan temple or like an, an <laughs> old coliseum. We, we do it even today. I don't know how many stories I've heard about home missions churches that started in old bars. Yeah. That, that they, they gutted the building and they turned it into a church and now people were getting filled with the new wine. Yes. Feet away from, from the old bar. This is part of the Christian tradition. We, we reclaim. Yes. We, we, renew and we restore and why we wouldn't do that to the academy i i it's beyond me why we wouldn't i i preached a message at a conference a few years ago called god in christ and why it matters and one of the one of the points that i even though it's preaching i always am i am always arguing something not in the emotional sense of 
yelling back and forth with somebody arguing, but in a technical sense of arguing. And one of the points that I made is that God eternally exists as Father, Word, and Spirit. And, of course, He in, incarnationally exists as Father, Son, and Spirit. Mm -hmm. And that in order to fully worship God, first, however a person views their anthropology, and to be honest, I don't know how spirit, soul, and body all compartmentalizes. I, I don't have a clue, just to be honest. Mm -hmm. But 1 Thessalonians 5.23 does give that whole idea that your whole body, soul, and spirit be preserved blameless unto the day of our Lord Jesus. So whatever that is, Paul puts the human, the human being in a tripartite description in that text. And so the, the point that I made is that he's Father, Word, and Spirit. We are body, soul, and spirit. And that to fully worship God, all of me must worship all of him. I love it. And so the body, soul, and spirit of me must worship the Father, Word, or Lagos, and spirit of him. And so I cannot fully worship God mm -hmm. if any part of me is not worshiping every part of him. Right. Man, I love that. And so... And so that includes um, intellect, education, using the mind to to engage um, uh, in, to engage God, to engage the world. And so I I think it's imperative that uh, young preachers growing up, even even women, this is not just a something that men should be doing. There are amazing uh, there's amazing work that that women are doing across all denominational uh, lines in academia as well. So uh, there, there, there are Jason Weatherly, our friend Jason Weatherly has some, uh -huh. has women in his master's theology class, in his master's degree, his MDiv uh, degree. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just for, for men, it's for, it's for women as, as well. And so I, I think it's imperative that anyone that has, has that inclination toward, uh, education and theology needs to be pursuing academic um, degrees and, and careers. I agree completely. Um, now so, you, no, go ahead. You, you asked me a second ago about, are there any pitfalls? Yeah. Um, I think you, you, you kind of answered that earlier that you can't possibly see what's wrong with, uh, what could be wrong with pursuing education. On, on a macro level, I would say no, I can't. On, on a the micro level, level, I got you. On, on the micro level, on the personal level, I would definitely say some people will get tangled up. Yeah. And if you're, if you're going to go to college and you feel like that's the direction the Lord is leading you, it won't hurt to read a couple of books about apologetics and postmodernism. And well, speaking of, I don't even know how to pronounce the guy's name, but it's it's Douglas G R O O T H U I S. And I'm actually reading one of his books right now called uh, po uh, Truth Decay Defending Christianity Against po Postmodernism. And he is a, he's friends with William Lane Craig. He's he, uh, the book was written back in 2000, and the, the book is all about uh, uh, a Christian response to postmodernism, and it is fantastic. It's a textbook in a class that I'm taking right now. And uh, if you recommend it, then I think everybody should read it. Do you have any uh, recommendations on postmodernism, books on postmodernism? Not on postmodernism specifically. Um, just for general apologetics, yeah. Generally speaking, well, I certainly recommend that people read uh, uh, the book *Truth Decay*. It's fantastic. Um, I I like listening to William Lane Craig. Um, just for reading, C.S. Lewis and G.K. Chesterton are your. They are, they are old. Like yeah. Chesterton was in the eighteen hundreds. I Catholic. think. 
a Catholic apologist. And and C.S. Lewis was Anglican in the 20s, I think. Um, yeah. But their points, just about defending Christianity in general. Mere Christianity is fantastic. Yes. Yes, uh, it is. Um, so is the great divorce, which yes. has nothing to do with... with divorce your, and remarriage, not, not at all. Um, just just for any of our anti-divorce brethren that are that are watching it's a, still a great book and uh, <clears throat> i've read of course this is more on his fantasy side of of lewis's writings but um the uh, line the witch the wardrobe that chronicles of narnia series is just absolutely fantastic literature yeah. It's awesome. I've got the Barnes and Noble edition. That's like all of the books bound into one, and I've read it multiple times. Yeah, it's fantastic material. And so I I have yet to read Screw Tape Letters, which is going to be my next Lewis project. You but need to read it, man. Yeah, um, it's, it's uh, I know it's fantastic material. I've read quotes from it, and in, and in, in, in fact, um, the Truth Decay book has quotes from. Uh, Lewis's screw tape letters and I've engaged it in other books, but I haven't actually read the screw tape letters themselves. So, but I am going to do that uh, so, very soon. So I would just say for people who are seriously thinking about going to college, definitely do it. If you feel like the Lord is leading you there, but don't, don't get crossed up because yeah. And, and there are all the tools, tools available to to help you stay grounded while while doing education. And there are some good conservative. Um, they're they're not well. There are a couple of good oneness options, apostolic uh, uh, colleges that are good options, which are, of course, Urshan um, is is a good option for somebody who may have some trepidation about going to a secular. Or, or a non-apostolic um, uh, Bible school, and so there are options that that create that have an atmosphere and a culture that helps keep people grounded. But there's also some very good Trinitarian, conservative Trinitarian colleges as well. That mm -hmm. the, the basics of of uh, of uh, understanding the nature of truth and the nature of Christianity that that are good options as well that are not don't promote a liberal agenda they have a high view of scripture uh etc and so so there there are good options for people to to uh to go to bible college and and have an atmosphere that encourages um staying biblically grounded i'm currently at regent university and um so far it's been uh, a fantastic experience Awesome. I've I've got a couple of friends who are connected to Regent in one way or, or the other. And seems to be a lot of Pentecostals, a lot of apostolics have uh, degrees from Regent. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, yeah, they, it's it, so far, it's been a, it's been a awesome school, but there are good options that, that apostolic can take advantage of in terms of formal education that that have a uh, educational atmosphere that that's conducive to staying grounded with a, a high view of scripture with uh, with a objective view of truth and all of the things that a person needs to to stay grounded theologically so uh, one of the questions following up for this that I wanted to ask are there any of the traditional apostolic, first of all, doctrines, which are um, are uh, kind of our trinity of theologies in the apostolic movement is the oneness of God, uh, tongues as initial evidence of the baptism of the Spirit, and baptism in Jesus' name, um, with the oral invocation of the name of Jesus in baptism. That's our big three doctrinal distinctives. distinctives. And then, of course, we have uh, like the external distinctives of what we call standards of separation. Uh, is there any, has there been anything in your educational 
a career that has po uh, posed a serious threat to any of those big issues uh, that you grew up with as an apostolic? Serious threat? No. <clears throat> I'll be transparent enough to say that everything I believe I have questioned at some point. Yeah. The, the existence of God. Yeah. Uh, the reality of heaven and hell. Yeah. Oneness, baptism in Jesus' name. I've, I've questioned all of it at some point or other. But if a person is sincerely seeking after God and, and they're doing the, their best to seek the Lord, those challenges will actually strengthen you to dig deeper. It, it's like a tree in the middle of a drought. You just put the roots deeper, and when you do, you find even more nourishment. So in terms of traditional apostolic standards, has there been anything about your academic education that's caused you to challenge any of those? Man, I'm just envious that I can't grow a beard like you. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'll, all I have is just a little stubble right now. So, <laughs> Man, I, my, my friend at work, joked with me one time and he said Clayton you're Native American you've exactly. got to be you've got to be Apache because you've got <laughs> you're an Apache there exactly man I, I hate you uh, <laughs> so so no in in from an educational standpoint no 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 yeah. I mean honestly you'll get questions but if you for me education does nothing but reveal the attitude of someone's heart. Yeah. If you actually believe it going yeah. into the classroom, all, some, all questions are gonna do is make you dig deeper and understand it more. Exactly. But if you're already on the fence about it and, and you're not sure, if you wanna be talked out of it, you will be. Exactly, exactly. All right, so kind of winding, kind of winding down here, uh, well, two more things before, I think two more things, it might end up only being one more thing. We'll see. Uh -huh. All right. So what, what do you plan in the future to do with your uh, academic uh, degrees, with your degrees, once you finish your um, doctoral degree, what's the future? What are you going to do with it? Well, if I can get two or three more, I might just pose as a thermometer. <laughs> hey, I have a friend of mine who is knocking 80 that in the last year or so just finished his third dissertation. Oh my goodness. Um, he, uh, he has a doctorate in philosophy, a doctorate in theology and a doctorate in education. Um, I think I'll, I'll stick with just with one. one. <laughs> Me I'll, too. Um, so hopefully I'll get to teach, uh, preferably at an apostolic college like Hershen or, or Wilson. Wilson. Yeah. Um, that, so that what's, be, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. That, that would be the, the dream to teach and pastor if the Lord should open that door. Um, I'll probably. So, all right. So in a, and uh, you have an acumen toward um, apologetics. Mm -hmm. So do you plan to do any writing or uh, debating? Yes, on both. Here's the slippery thing, at least for a little while, is, as you know, there is a little bit of arrogance to the academy. Yeah. And no the I mean, no disrespect with that, with that phrase. It's just that if you immediately start publishing self-published books before you get any like solid publications from reputed publishers, yeah, um, scholars can look at you as if you're not a serious contender. Yeah. You, you can't get published by Oxford, so you had to publish on Amazon. Yeah. Uh, that, that sort well, of... Well, it's too late for me. I've already done it, so... And, and in a lot of ways, it's, it's just easier. And I, I wish that vibe wasn't there. If it's yeah. serious material, who cares what publisher it's from? 
Yeah. Um, I've read stuff from fairly well-known publishers that was in, horrible. My, in my opinion was just vapid. So yeah, pitifully argued, like just terrible. A, a friend of mine one time said that he went to an academic conference and the, the subject, he, he listened to a, a conference paper and the subject of the paper was basically arguing for the distinction between agape uh, for, for agapo and philo uh -huh. and and like that distinction has been discounted multiple multiple times by people who know greek but this dude was like applauded and everybody listened intently because he was a phd student from harvard yeah and so even though he was recycling a discredit and and i don't know the guy's name so i'm not taking pot shots at anybody this is yeah this is here's an example of and but he was taken seriously by this particular just conference. because it was a harvard degree yeah but because he was a harvard phd student if if i understand my friend's story correctly and so I, I wish that we could just take the content seriously, but the uh, the politics of of the schools are what they are, and so I will write on my own eventually. But I'm going to try to get my dissertation published first. Yeah, um, maybe get that converted into a an actual book, and then we'll see where the debate well, stage. Like I say, it's too late for me now, so I uh, so I'm not going to stop. Uh -huh. I'm going to continue to write, continue to publish, and eventually someday I'm um, I'm hoping to be picked up by um, a publishing house somewhere, um, write something more mainstream. Well, your trajectory is a little bit different than mine. You've been a, a pastor before. You've, you've been in ministry a lot longer than I have. And so... I've been in ministry longer than you are old. <laughs> and, and you're not 26 yet are you no so i i was preaching before you were born so wow um that's like weird to actually say that out loud <laughs> well man i'm i'm glad we're friends because yeah. it's a, a lot of people who especially that are older in the ministry uh, sometimes people don't make friends with the young guys so i i appreciate that well i always have and i always will and uh man there's going to be a lot of awesome academic work that we do together over the next um 20 25 maybe 30 years if the lord gives me health um that we will do together along with a couple other mutual friends that we have and so I'm I'm looking forward to our upcoming conversation with Jason Weatherly. Absolutely. And he's a brilliant mind. We talked about and and uh I am like serious as I can be. I am COVID nineteen serious about it. <laughs> Is that too soon? Uh yeah, I I don't know. I don't think so, but uh so just to repeat it so someone else can be offended by hearing it the second time. Uh I'm COVID-19 serious about us doing a three views book on something. Oh, I'd love it. As far as I know, no apostolics have done a three views type uh, book on uh, anything. And so if, when we do it, hopefully we will be the first, hopefully nobody sees this video and is like, we want to beat them to the punch. Uh -huh. But if they do, we can have this date stamp to know that it was our idea. Was our idea that that we decided we were going to do it before they did but at some point uh, i'd like for me and you and jason to do a three views book on some topic um, um not ex exactly sure what that what that would be at this point but i have no doubt that there is a theological topic where the three of us have differing views on it and so i think that would be an incredible do what eschatology most likely because I know that Jason and I disagree. He's a post-tribber, um, <clears throat> amillennialist. I am, and if I'm misspeaking for him, which I don't think I am, he can post in the comments on this video when it's published and correct me, but he's a post-trib 
I'm a millennialist. I'm a partial preterist post millennialist. And, and I'm still figuring it out that I have a lot of sympathies for historicism. Okay. So this would be a great topic to, uh, for us to, to write a three views book on. So, um, that would, that would be incredible. Well, man, thank you so much for taking the time to, to do this conversation with me today. And, uh, it's been an absolute privilege, man. This has been fun. And no, thank you for, for having me on. And I'm definitely looking forward to our conversation with Jason. So, so go check out, um, uh, Clayton's lectionary blog. He also, what all social media platforms are you on? Um, I, I try to keep Facebook and Instagram for people that I actually know, but you can follow me on Twitter at Clayton J. Killian. Okay. So go, go, uh, <coughs> follow him on Twitter. Uh, go subscribe to his blog. Uh, you will be tremendously blessed by his, um, by his writings and his perspectives. And so as I have been closing out the most recent uh, episodes of Forward Talk, Clayton, Clayton, I want to thank you for joining with me and reversing the silence with Forward Talk. I love it, man. Have a great day, man. Mm -hmm.